This episode is sponsored by Verve. Click the link in the description below for a free seven day trial and stay tuned to the end of the video for more details. You know, in the midst of all of the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy hype, I've noticed a lot of people talk about how Crash is this awesome series. No. Now don't get me wrong here, obviously the Crash Trilogy, as well as Team Racing, those games are classics and should be remembered as such. But even when you want to look post PS1, you have a game like, uh, say Crash Nitro Kart, that's actually a pretty good sequel to Team Racing. And a game I actually already did a video on, Crash Twin Sanity. Now this game is, uh... It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's pretty good. But realistically, that's only about a third of the entire franchise. With the license to Crash being tossed around to different developers all the time over the years, some less than quality titles were inevitable. And boy, did we get some of those. These aren't necessarily the worst of the worst, but these are games that are certainly bad. So before taking a look at what made Crash great in the first place, it's time to take a look at how far he fell. Starting off here, we have Crash Boom Bang for the DS. It's just, it's such a weird name, Boom Bang. I, I get it, I mean, you had Bash beforehand, so you're just gonna throw out more B words that come to mind? Okay, sure, I can do that too. So in Crash Bada Boom Bada Bing, you have the choice of a few characters to play as, and despite them being concrete characters, you can rename them whatever you like. I get to rename Crash, huh? Alright, let's see here. Ah, perfect. The story begins with this brand new villain, Viscount. Viscount, huh? Something tells me this plot is gonna be about money. He is on pursuit of the super big power crystal, and since he is a millionaire and would rather everybody else do the hard work for him, he challenges the lovable cast of characters, plus a shockingly terrifying looking Aku Aku, to find the crystal, rewarding the winner with 100 million <laughs> What? I mean, sure, why not? That's a reasonable amount. I mean, to be fair, with that much money on the line, I would quite frankly do just about anything. Looks like our lucky break. Wow, what a response. And actually, that's about all the story that we get. The game then quickly begins. And there we go. It's a board game. You see, Crash Bash was only a Mario Party clone in terms of it being minigame based. This is full on, everybody rolls a dice and moves along a board. Although, actually, everybody moves at the same time. Take that, Mario. How you win, though, is pretty weird. Each map has a unique goal to work towards, but having the most overall points is what gets you to win, meaning it is possible for you to win the board's goal, but not necessarily win the whole thing. What? Honestly, the game doesn't explain anything, and heaven forbid you take some time to explore the menu to learn about the items that you can use. Seriously, halfway into reading the first sentence, a five second countdown timer pops up before kicking me back into the dice roll. God, what? I'm playing single player mode. What's the rush? As for the mini games, oh God, they're dreadful. Some of them do kinda harken back to the series past, but most of them are just like, hey, sure, a cartoon bandicoot riding a realistic horse. That's the weirdest thing I've seen all day. You're also probably wondering now, what's with all the speech bubbles that are popping up? Well, that's the whole boom bang part of the game. You see, when playing multiplayer, you can distract the player in first place with the simple push of a button. And I gotta say, in single player, it's really fun when the minigame you're playing is purely visual based and you can't see a thing. Oh, it is such a good gameplay mechanic, let me tell ya! And I'm not even lying, this is the boom bang part of the game. Cause you can customize it and it automatically says boom or bang. That's it, that's the boom bang, I can't, that's so dumb! I am like so confused, I don't know what happened here, 
but Sonic Bada Boom Bada Bing is just terrible. I couldn't even bring myself to complete the really short story mode. I got really close, but I, and actually none of my opponents, were able to discover the last item that we needed to complete the map. And after the, and I really wish I was joking here, seventh time in a row I played this stupid Titanic game, I gave up and nearly snapped my 3DS in two. Quite frankly, the fact I made it through six of them, I guess, I guess that means I have a problem, actually. It's easy to assume that the portable scene is where Crash had it the worst. I mean, the DS gave us boom bang for crying out loud. And you would also assume that if we went further back down the timeline, oh, the Game Boy Advance, oh no, the GBA and Crash Bandicoot, that has to be a match made in hell, right? I know you're thinking that. Wrong. The Huge Adventure and Entrance are 2D platformers that do end up recycling elements from the PS1 games, but considering those games had plenty of side-scrolling elements, this actually works pretty well, and they're fun! They're certainly better than the fate that Spyro had on the console. And hell, even Crash Nitro Kart was a pretty good game on here. However, this game really sucks too. Crash Purple Ripto's Rampage. Wait, wait, wait. Ripto? Yeah, that's right. Ripto from the Spyro the Dragon series. And hey, would you look at that, here is Spyro Orange, the Cortex Conspiracy. You got Mario and Sonic, Professor Layton and Phoenix Wright, Kratos and Fat Princess. All right, maybe not that one. Crossovers are something that video game fans always dream of, and Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon are no exception. Working what seemed like hand in hand during the PlayStation 1 days, so much so that demos of each series were found in the other's games, it didn't really matter to anybody that the original creators no longer had the franchise rights. We wanted a crossover. And, and, and well, we got, we got one, I guess. You know what, let's give it a shot. The story begins with Cortex and Ripto concocting a plan to defeat both Crash and Spyro, and their best idea? Put masks of Spyro on the enemies to fool Crash into thinking that Spyro is the bad guy. Oh my god, this is one of the worst games I've ever played. So naturally, Crash goes out to stop whatever bad stuff is going on, and of course, collect crystals and gems along the way. And the way you get them is by completing minigames. Uh, again, some of them do sort of make sense in context of the series, but something like blowing up sheep with the bazooka to prevent them from running into nitro crates, thereby blowing themselves up? I, I don't know, that seems to be a bit counterproductive. Come on, Crash, you can do it, you can do it, yeah! yeah. I mean, like Boom Bang, I could spend time here talking about the minigames, but they really are just all bad. The entire single player story mode only takes like two hours, and most of the minigames get repeated multiple times. At least it's better than Boom Bang in that respect, because I didn't have to play the same minigame over and over. There's credit where credit is due, I suppose. And hey, Crash brings his own Game Boy Advance on the adventure. Not even he wants to play this crap. Further along in the story, you eventually encounter Spyro. And since they think each other is the bad guy, meaning I guess the bad guy's plan actually kinda worked, they settled their differences by tossing Molotov cocktails at each other over a moat. That's, that's classic, classic Crash. Honestly, nothing else throughout the adventure is even remotely interesting, and things end off with, of course, a fight against both Cortex and Ripto. And when the final boss has a 60 second time limit, you know you're in for a treat. And by treat, I mean it's super easy and shockingly laggy. Spyro promises to help out whenever trouble arises once again. Crash then puts him in a headlock. Done. Oh, and as for Spyro Orange? Yeah, that game is even worse. And I think Hunter agrees. But fine, you know what? Maybe talking about two minigame collections is not necessarily the best barometer for how bad Crash used to be. I can fix that. Let's take a look at the two last console games to ever be released before this game saved the Bandicoot. Oh boy. 
Now, I have negatively talked about both of these games before, but honestly, Crash of the Titans? That's actually pretty cool. Rather than being a pure platformer, the developers opted to make a game that's more of a beat-em-up. And aside from moronically locking the spin ability until like 20 minutes into the game, the combat actually works pretty well. It is super simple, Crash is simply fun to control, you level up often, each chapter has certain goals that give you collectibles. It is legitimately a pretty good game. The Wii version even does the whole point to gather items thing one month before Super Mario Galaxy did it. And sure, all of the redesigns are pretty weird, and I don't really understand the whole adding tribal tattoos to Crash thing. I also can't fathom what in the hell they did to Uka Uka. But if the discussion here is talking about Crash Bandicoot post PS1, I would definitely say at the very least, this is better than Wrath of Cortex. Yeah, that's right, I said it. The main gimmick of the game was the ability to possess a bigger mutant thanks to Aku Aku, which you can then control for a while for more combat. And the game actually does strike a decent balance of Crash gameplay and mutant gameplay. There's a bunch of different mutants too, so there's quite a bit of variety there as well. So then just how did they completely ruin it in the sequel, Mind Over Mutant? Well... I got a whole list of reasons here. For one, every major cutscene is presented in a different style. You got hand puppets, standard cartoons, black and white, old school superhero cartoons, South Park, what, that's, that's just South Park. I mean, I guess they were trying to go for something cute here, like, hey, look at all of the characters in these wacky different styles. But after a game that already completely changed the Crash Bandicoot formula, all of these random cutscene style changes just gives the game a complete lack of identity when basically all of the plot development is told this way, it's dumb. For all that is good and holy on this planet and universe, there's a cutscene where Uka Uka is being fed cake while hooked up to a milking machine and it's presented in the style of South Park and I, I cannot believe that's a sentence. I was so tired of that guy. Felt like I married my mother. Not that I've thought about that. <laughs> As for the gameplay itself, eh, honestly, it's just the same but worse. It now goes for a bit of a pseudo open world thing, though unlike Crash Twin Sanity, which actually did that fairly well, this is really just a series of linear pathways leading off of Crash's house. So it's really not open world, and I'm unsure why they went with that idea in the first place. Oh yeah, and some of the characters got redesigned again? I, I mean, that's a sign of good confidence right there. I don't know who designed both remodels of Crunch, but I, I, they're, well, they're bad. And to be completely honest with you, the game just sort of happens. Your first goal is to gather machine parts for Coco to finish her experiment. This leads to a pretty basic linear area that gives you a good amount of time to get used to how the game plays. And again, since Titans felt okay, this is actually totally fine. You quickly get back to your house and give Coco the parts. And after a cutscene, it's time for the second mission. As, as, the, as the whole, that's the whole mission. Ah. And then in no time, the game gets super boring, super quick. You just keep getting told to go down different linear trails and there's absolutely no challenge whatsoever. Just go from point A to point B constant repetitive combat that never really gets any harder, nearly endless mutant usage, eliminating the whole mutant crash balance of before, and a ton, and I mean a ton, of backtracking. You have to go back and forth through the snowy area like three or four times, and it's, it doesn't change, there's just, there's a couple new enemies, but you're really just doing the same thing over and over again. And to add fuel to the fire, there's actually one area in the game about halfway through where you randomly teleport to your destination instead of being forced to backtrack and walk there. And I gotta tell you, after already doing a lot of backtracking, I kind of felt offended. 
And sure, if you haven't played either of these two games, much of Mind Over Mutant is going to sound similar to Crash of the Titans. But in Crash of the Titans, you at least had goals within every level of taking out a certain number of enemies or getting a high combo. So while the combat was super simplistic, you still had to do a fairly good job of it. Your combo doesn't go away until you take damage. It's not time-based like in Titans, even eliminating that challenge. And there's just no sense of escalation here either. The game never strays away from its basic idea, and when it does, it's usually something pretty dumb. Like, oh, hey, look at this. It's a mutant that you've never seen before doing Michael Jackson's thriller dance without fitting music in the background. Be because of course? Well, the best part about the game, at least, is they decided to bring back Embryo. That's cool. Yes, it is I, Embryo. My name sounds like fetus. <laughs> <coughs> oh, God, did I? Whoa. Did I just enjoy something from this game? This is so, so weird. Everything about the game seems so poorly done, but Embryo is legitimately really funny. I was in the first game! He's constantly going about inventing everything, and even tosses in some random real-world references. He comes off as so over-the-top and crazy, at one point, he even says he wrote the Bible. Read your Bible, I wrote it. I have no idea what happened during this game's development, but Embryo is seriously the only highlight of this game. And then there's a boss fight that he's not even involved in, he's just sort of in the background. And then once that fight is done, he's out of the game. He just goes away as a cute little cartoon, parodying that scene from The Incredible Hulk. What, what, what a way to go. Back when this game first came out, I honestly had really high hopes for it after enjoying Titans. But at least now it sort of makes sense how this was the last major Crash Bandicoot game before the series went into a nearly 10 year long hiatus. Did, did that spacesuit wearing bird just spread its cheeks and fart poison gas at me? Oh, oh, oh okay. I, I need to go lay down. Man, all, all those games, they were they were definitely pretty bad. At least the bad Crash games are gonna make the Insane Trilogy all the sweeter, right? So, so there's some good news. But that's still a couple days away. I need a good pick-me-up in the meantime. I got it. I'll watch some anime on Verve. I'm glad you asked. Verve is a service brought to you by the team at Crunchyroll that combines a ton of content channels into one, such as Funimation, Rooster Teeth, Cartoon Hangover, and more. It is a great way to check out some of your favorite content and even discover some more. It's available on PS4, Xbox One, iOS, and Android, and here's the cool part, by downloading the app in the link below, you get a free 7-day trial and you get unlimited access to all of the content ad-free in 1080p. Now of all the options that are there, I personally recommend watching My Hero Academia, which is subbed on Crunchyroll or dubbed on Funimation. From what I could gather, this anime had a ton of hype behind it, and with the second season out, I figured I would give it a watch, and I gotta say, it is honestly one of the best anime I have seen in a long time. But even on top of that, you got more great content on Verve like Rooster Teeth's Ruby, Cartoon Hangover's Bee and Puppycat, or even another hyped anime, Attack on Titan. Again, subbed on Crunchyroll, dubbed on Funimation. Huge thank you to the guys over at Verve. This is legitimately a super cool service. And again, if you're interested, be sure to click the link down below for a free 7-day trial. I do not think you will regret it. And also, stay tuned because next time, we are taking a look at Crash Bandicoot The Insane Trilogy. Super excited.